Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson, and I'm here with co-hosts Eric Johnson and Alicia Swamy, and today we are here with Jeff Charlton. Welcome, Jeff. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, it's good evening from me in London. Thank um, you so much for joining us from London. Well, it's great. It's uh, You're the only Americans I can talk to at the moment because I've been banned by all the other groups. <laughs> Why have you been banned? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Um, I disagreed with uh, Dr. Schumacher, and uh, he thought I was insolent. Um, well, then you're amongst I, friends. We disagree with him, too. <laughs> um, I disagreed with ISCAI, um, and they said that I was, um, uh, what was it, discourteous, because I'd criticized a, a consensus document that had my name on but i'd never seen it before they put your name on something you never saw well it was a consensus document from the ieps of iscai and i am one of them i was a founding member and i said well you know this is you know the organization carries uh, clout and gravitas and it shouldn't put out things that people don't agree with so i said you know this, as far as I'm concerned, is a is a is a dreadful document because it's saying the only way that you can um, decontaminate a mold affected building is the Schumacher principle or the you know the fine particle medical safe, which is correct for some people, but it doesn't. Um, you know, the majority of people couldn't afford it. The majority of people don't need it. So, you know, by saying you can't use anything else, I thought was wrong. So I've, I've been cancelled. Cancelled. So Fascinating. Um, Dr. Schumacher suggested that uh, IEP should um, insist on doing Actinos when they do their surveys. And I said, well, you know, I don't think so. I don't see the point because several reasons. First of all, it's expensive. Second reason, when we give the Actino results to the client, they don't know what to do with them. And then their doctors don't know what to do with them. So, you know, I'm looking for water damage. If I've got water damage and I've got biological activity of one sort, it's probably gonna be other sorts there too. So, you know, if the people if the doctor wants to know further, then he can prescribe extra testing, but he can make his bill look expensive, not me. So that's why I'm off of both panels of that. Um, you mentioned my daughter, Eric. That was very kind of you and uh, nice. My daughter, um, at uh, 25, 26 years old, she was a futures trader on the London floor, open outcry. She was the youngest girl ever to go on the floor. And she was a kickboxer. And uh, she, by the time she was 25, 26, she bought her fourth house in London. So she was exceptionally um, positive. And she phoned up me and my wife one day and said, Dad, I can't cope. Can I come and live with you and mum? And I said, well, of course you can. Blimey, I can't believe she's, I can't believe these words are coming out of her. And she came and stayed with me for six weeks. And uh, she started to get better. And uh, one day she said after six weeks, Dad, would you go over to my new house and um, get a couple of books for me? I want to do a bit of reading. So I went over her house. I, you know, this, was, this house was three months old, traditional built brick and tile. And uh, I was only in her house for 10 minutes and I got a nosebleed. And I thought, there's something wrong here. So I did a quick survey. Now, it wasn't, wasn't difficult because she was out the house at six in the morning and didn't come home till 7.30 at night. So the only place she was was bedroom and TV lounge, basically. So uh, I started in the bedroom and the ensuite bathroom had carpeting going from the bell from the bedroom and uh i saw a small wet patch I, I got a knife cut it open and there was a patch of mold the size of a cigarette box 
anyway, I sent it off to labs in America because it was pointless here getting trying to get analyzed. And uh, the next day or two days later, she got a phone call from the hospital saying they wanted to send an ambulance for her um, for additional tests. And, uh, and she was a bit upset and shocked. And she said, what sort of tests? And um, the doctor said something and it made her cry. So I said, let me speak to him. And, he, and I said, what's the issue? And he said, well, we can't believe how immune compromised she is. She had a Bupa medical examination. Bupa is a private medical company, insurance company in the UK, uh, which companies provide. And uh, she was absolutely fighting fit. And um, when she came to, this is University College Hospital, which is one of London's leading hospitals. When she came, because she was, you know, chronic fatigue, we tested her blood and she was in the final stages of leukemia, as far as they were concerned. And they wanted to do another test. Uh, and then they was about to start radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And I said, oh, I said, uh, well, let's uh, double take on that. So I phoned the lab. I said, do me a favor, please. Um, I could really do with those results. Anyway, it turned out to be trichoderma, uh, probably producing T2 toxins that can turn off her immune system. And um, she walked into the hospital. They was going to send an ambulance for us. They, she, they thought she was that bad. She walked into the hospital and they couldn't believe it was the same girl. And they asked, what on earth has she done to get better? And uh, I said to her, just tell them you've been to Lourdes and prayed in, in France. You know, it's a place there where people go as a last resort to pray to God to get better. And, um, and of course, they just couldn't understand it. And um, now this was a brand new house. And I said to my daughter, you know, as my daughter, I could decontaminate it. I could try, but you know what? I'm not going to. I want you to move, and I'm going to make the builder buy it back. So the builder bought it back, and she moved, and we've got three granddaughters now that we'd never probably have had if she'd have gone through all the treatment they was prescribing. And I wonder what would have happened to her if I wasn't her dad. And um, it upsets me greatly when I see so many people sick who haven't really realised yet what might be making them sick so and it's funny because um i got the nosebleed she got sick uh she decided she wanted to come to work with me because she wanted to um learn what we're doing and sort of spread the word well you can guess what happened next she came to work with me for about i don't know four weeks only part time and um uh, she just got so sick and she had to stop. And I said, no, you've got to stop. And it's quite amazing. Uh, I've, she gets a cold, I get a cold. None of the rest of the family does. We're very similar genetically. So what she gets, I get, and, you know, so it's, it's quite weird. But Eric, you don't know that I've been sick too. Uh, not as sick as you, mate, but um, uh, three years ago, um, I found I couldn't get out of bed and it wasn't, I don't know what it was. It wasn't chronic fatigue. It just, my legs didn't work and my, nothing seemed to work. And if I wanted to get out of a chair, I had to sort of fall on the floor and get up with my elbows and terrible leg cramps that I knew about, but thought they're just leg cramps. I didn't really realize how excruciatingly painful they were. And I thought, I wonder if I've got mold illness. And after doing it, you know, I was I was 70 then. And I thought, you know, how come I'm just getting it? Anyway, um, I couldn't walk and I could and then suddenly my words were coming out back to front and um I couldn't talk. And uh I went to my doctor, and uh this was just about the start of COVID, and he wrote, scribbled something on a piece of paper. And he said, I want you to get this. And when I read it, it was how to improve your self-esteem. You know, <laughs> so uh, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to punch him. And, um, 
and uh, so anyway, they prescribed prednisone. Uh, well, they, first of all, they did a blood test on me, and um, they actually phoned me up and said, Jeff, your blood's so thick, you've got a chance of going blind overnight. And I want you to take 60 milligrams a day of prednisone. And I thought, you know, this, this can't be right. It's a terrible drug, isn't it, prednisone? And uh, so I didn't. And, um, but I didn't get better. I still felt bad. So I took one tablet. And the amazing thing is, I don't know if you know, prednisone is an anti-inflammatory. And I took one tablet within 15 minutes. I was fine. Now, when I went back to the doctors, I, w I, I ran back to the doctors and I said, hey, I think if I took two, I could fly. And he looked at me, he said, well, prednisone can have that effect on some people. Well, I only took it for a couple of weeks and um, I only took one or two tablets a day. Um, but it certainly helped me. It didn't help with my um, speech and I developed tics. I've still got ticks, and if I if I talk about me, my ticks get worse. Um, but I put up with it. I get ticks when I'm driving, so I don't talk about that too much in case I lose my license. But um, so I do get ticks. I still get ticks. And the the interesting point is that I just um, did a survey in someone's house. I thought I was over it all, and I went in someone's house last week, and um, Within half an hour, I couldn't talk again. Not quite couldn't talk, but the words were very back to front. Um, so I realized there are some molds or combinations that can trigger me that haven't done in 30 years of me doing this work. Um, at, at 71, I got diagnosed with ADHD. I had two um, neuroquants done um, and um, they show brain inflammation and atrophy, brain atrophy. I had blood tests done. The problem is, is that I've got to be honest with you. I had an awful lot of testing and I got an awful nowhere. And it was only when I avoided exposure that I got better. And I have to wonder exactly what all this testing is about um i know there's people i mean every client that i go into they've got 500 pounds worth or 500 dollars worth of vitamin pills and pills on their bedside table and a thousand dollars worth of pills on the sideboard in the lounge so they're all taking pills and then when i do my investigation i find they've got horrible water damage a historic water damage current water damage and the the i take qpcrs and you know I, I take swabs for dna testing and you know their homes are you know extremely potentially toxigenic and they've got no idea and it's you know and of course the nutritionists uh, they do a great job but they think that vitamins are going to make people better when they're living in a toxic suit. So that's where I'm on that. Well, that's it. You know, you talk about chronic fatigue syndrome and actually the name is a misnomer because the center for disease control was so scared about what they saw going on that they came up with that stupid name to hide it. Ah. But that's how it was cramped so bad that uh, you, you couldn't move. And I remember watching an advertisement saying, well, this is what chronic fatigue syndrome looks like. And somebody slides to the edge of the bed and sits up. I'm going, I can't sit up like that. I've got to crawl out on the floor and push myself up slower. I'll pass out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, well, I don't know what they could call it. And, and, and you know something, Eric, I, I, I admire you. Um, I've given up trying to fight people and I just do what I'm told now. And, I, and I've, I've noticed that the more you try to help or have an opinion, the more you're frowned upon as being a scaremonger. And, um, you know, I, it, it's funny. Um, 
I realized some time ago I couldn't do medically safe remediation. Two reasons. Um, nobody could afford it. And the second reason is I couldn't get people that could do it because everybody, nobody wants to clean every square inch. Nobody wants to do that. They want to shut the door, read a paper, smoke a cigarette. And, um, you know, when you come back, say, oh, yeah, I've done a good job, haven't I? Because you can't see this wearing the king's new clothes, isn't it? There's nothing there. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the Anderson, Hans Anderson uh, story, you know, where the king wears an invisible suit, isn't it grand? You know, they go, oh, yeah, there's nothing there. Um, so it, it can't be done. So I stopped doing, stopped doing it when I got rid of my company and I'm just working as an IEP. And we've now been invaded by American companies like Pure Maintenance and BioSuite. And they're doing a dry mist of hydrogen peroxide and they're adding some um, um, citric acid. They're making parasitic acid. They're, 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 they've got a tiny fan with BioSuite. And, you know, I go in and I test after they've done it. And after the Pure Maintenance, it's usually worse because they spray it in their dry fog into cavities and when they spray something into a cavity stuff comes out the cavity um you know and it's i i see everybody getting cheated so i thought well look, i'm going to try and do some things to try and help people so i've started to do and i've i, I sort of i feel awkward so telling you what I'm doing because we both know it's not right, but it's the best that anybody can get. And when I explain to you what I'm doing, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll accept or understand or comment or, and criticize maybe. I'm saying to people, look, if you, if you want to clean the air, you can go with aerosolver and we'll do the fine particle dropout, but you've got to clean it up. Not me. I haven't got the, I haven't got anybody. You've got to do that yourself. I'll show you how to do it. I'll tell you how to do it. So that's a very simple thing. After you've done your remediation, I'll give, I'm working with uh, Sandia. Do you know Sandia? You probably know Sandia, don't you? Sandia uh, from um, Sandia Laboratories from um, this American company. They developed a decontamination agent for CBRN. And it's, it's basically, I don't know exactly, but it's uh, hydrogen peroxide with a quat. And um, the quat gives it huge penetrating powers. And although we know we don't want to kill stuff, but there's bacteria there as well. And there are some fragments that may get oxidized. But after all of that, then I do a massive air exchanging using huge blowers that we install. And um, so we just blow all these fragments out. Uh, under, put the whole house under negative pressure. I'll only do houses, I can't do flats. Um, and then I'm using another American product, um, Aegis, which has got good biostat capabilities. And it's a bonded, um, not a silane, bonded silane. Are you conversant with that? No, I'm not. Okay. Well, what it does is it hits the surface with such an impact that it creates um, spikes molecular size spikes, which trap bacteria, fragments. So it gives you some form of protection for a couple of years. So it's not a chemical biostat, it's a non-active biostat that's a mechanical, it's actually a mechanical. So it's hypoallergenic and it's been being, I was using it in America with people 20 years ago but I, I just felt that it was something that can be used now in combination with other things. So it's not the best, but there you go. And I'd like to go back to the ISEAI, um, their consensus document. It's called Document 101. And um, in it, they say um, an IEP must be used to do clearance on a home, which is fine, okay. And he should write the specification. Okay, that's fine. Um, but then they say the contracts have all no doubt foul and have to do it all again. Well, of course, we're now going to say to a contractor, you failed, 
because the IEP said you failed, so you're not going to get paid. So now you've got the contractors expected to do the whole house cleaning again free of charge or be argued that he wasn't very good in the first place. Well, of course, this is meticulous cleaning. And even the Institute of Medicine has said that meticulous cleaning is unlikely to, to succeed. You know, and then you've got Greg French, who's saying, well, look, after aerosol, well, we're going to put plastic bin bags on the wall and go back after six weeks and test the dust to see if there's any fragments uh, for PCR analysis. What I'm thinking, you're going to cover your walls for six weeks. You know, people want to be able to walk out of home and walk back in a day or two later and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm safer. So that's that. What a crazy situation. So I haven't um, been involved in remediation efforts or uh, therapy. My goal has been to get the top researchers involved in this so they can analyze the situation and we can achieve sort of a global consensus and get all of our mainstream doctors in on what's going on. Who's this, Michael Charance? No, I'm going after uh, Stanford and Harvard and the Open Medicine Foundation, oh. uh, CDC, NIH. I'm yeah. saying something is going on here and uh, this is really too difficult for most low level doctors to handle. Yeah. So we, we need a federal effort. Well, have you seen the efforts in Australia? Yeah. I mean, I mean they, you know, they're, they're trying to push it the right way. We've got new efforts in the UK now. This is, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be interested on this perspective. Um, uh, I think it was about 20 years ago maybe a bit longer, um, uh, I set up an organisation called the British Damage Management Association and I invited them to collaborate. I was the first chairman of IICRC in UK, not in America, but in UK, and ASCR, that's the old, that's uh, old RIA. And um, I said, look, you know, let's follow these guys. They're writing standards. We can have an input. And... Um, we were being joined by, I'd invited the insurance industry to join us in this contractors association. And um, the insurers didn't want this to happen. And they drove down the standards. Well, they didn't drive them down. They ignored them. I mean, we've got, we've got loads of standards, but everybody ignores them. Um, and they say, well, we don't have to follow them. And, so I helped write, um, uh, it's called a public awareness specification called PAS 64. I'll give you a copy if you're interested. Um, and in it, we say, and I, I was the technical input on this. I said, look, you know, when you've had a water damage, you need to get verification that it's dry, not just trust me. You need to get a verification that the air is clean, not just it looks clean. So... I've, I, and I said, it needs to be done by someone that's a third party, disinterested and qualified and competent. And the insurance industry hated it so much that within a week of it being published, they set up a British standard, not a public awareness specification, a complete British standard on what to do after your home's been flooded. And guess what the, um, you could, um, you, you'll get it straight away what was their specification for ensuring that the house was clean, dry, and sanitary? A white glove test. So that was it. Wipe it with a white glove. If, if it's clean, um, it must be sanitary. So, and it must be dry. You know, if you can't feel the water, it must be dry. So it's been a race to the bottom here with uh, contractors. None of the contractors make any money anymore. You know, when we look at the, prices American contractors charge per day for a dehumidifier, British contractors would be lucky to get that for a fortnight. So none of them make, most of them don't even publish their accounts because they're so bad. How they get away with that, I don't know. Um, and of course, they've all, you know, the British market is looking at, you know, we've had, I've, I've been agents for Goldmore. I don't know if you know Goldmore, it's an Australian product. I asked the questions for well, what's in it and they wouldn't tell me. 
well, where does the mold go? They couldn't tell me. So I stopped, so I stopped being an agent, but they're still selling it, of course. And, you know, it's, um, you know, at my age, I'm not commercially bothered anymore. I'm not bothered about anything. And, you know, so um, I'm, I'm bothered about the people that I can help. Um, but I'm, even with that, you know, I, I struggle to get up and down stairs now. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking I'm going to have to put my prices up because I'm going to have to limit what I can do. And, you know, if I, if I don't put the prices up, um, I'm going to get inundated with people that are asking me to do stuff that I just can't do. I just can't work five days a week. So, you know, I'd rather just work two or three days a week. And the easiest way to limit it is cost. And by the way, it's not as mercenary as it sounds because if people, you know, people, um, if, if I say to people, look, if you think my costs are high, the cost of your treatment, the cost of remediation is going to dwarf it. And so you really need, you know, you really need to get a good idea of what's actually going on in your home um, and go from there. And of course, the mold is gold saying is now in the UK and, you know, people set up and they're doing mold surveys with um, an M lab three. I mean, I just got, a, I just been asked to look at a, a, a lab result. It was from M lab. This isn't M labs fault. Um, there was a debris loading of four. Does everybody understand what a debris loading is? Not me. Okay. Well, if I take an air sample, um, there's going to be a certain amount of dust in the air. Well, they they um, judge it from one to five, or one to, well, M lab do one to four. So if there's a little bit of dust, it's one debris load in one. If there's a load of dust, and when they look through the microscope at the slide, and they can't see the spores for dust, they say it's got a debris load in a four. So this lab report came in front of me. It had a debris loading of four, but there was 275,000 spores of Aspergillus penicillin. And I thought, well, how could you see 275,000 spores of penicillin when it's got a debris loading of four? So what he's done is they've actually gone and sucked the air straight off of some visible mould, which, of course, you know, it's cheating, it's stupid, and but it's seems to be common practice so it's the the problem is is you know everybody i walk into at least one divorce a week at least one divorce a week where the wife is ill and the husband's all right and he thinks she's just lazy he thinks she won't get out of bed because she's lazy um he thinks her her illness is psychosomatic you know everybody becomes doctors when they're they're other half get sick um and i and i try to talk to people and they say well you know and i say look i, I can't give you medical advice i'm not qualified but why are you saying it then i'm saying well, i'm just giving you opinion on on stuff that i've been working with for 30 years and uh it gets very difficult because everybody today i mean because when i got sick i got someone it was my son's youngest my youngest son's best friend he'd been out of work for a while i said look i'll train you to go and collect data for me so he went and collected data for me and then i would write the reports and uh, four months ago he left me phoned up my clients or hospitals and doctors and nutritionists that i work with and said i've left jeff i'm now doing it on my own uh and i'm cheaper than jeff well I'd only ever trained him to collect information, not analyze it. And he's done a two day course on water damage. And now he's saying he's one of the leading experts in the UK. Well, the issue is, is he's not unusual because who knows who is and who isn't. And, uh, you know, you, you, I mean, I'll give you this for an example of, of how awful the UK can be. I did a job about three years ago for a very important lady. And uh, just because they're important doesn't mean they're honest. But she asked me 
she'd she'd lost the baby and i'd got into her she she was very upset and i'd gone into her home and i didn't know she'd lost the baby and um i'd got into her home and i was looking at it and uh, and i said look you've got some extremely toxic molds here and there was one in particular that can cause uh, uh, spontaneous abortion and you know real serious gynecological issues and she burst into tears and she said, my God, I, I, my doctor said he can't understand why I had a miscarriage. And so she needed some support and help and I gave her support and help. And she decided she wanted to sue the landlord of the, she was renting a place, she was paying thousands and thousands of pounds a week for it. And um, she said to me, Jeff, I want you to write off about $300,000 worth of Gucci handbags and shoes and stuff. And I said, Look, I know your home is contaminated, but I, I haven't seen your shoes and handbags and I've got no idea if they're contaminated. And I can't write something that I can't substantiate. So she got very angry with me and she called in her friend. He's an, a member of parliament, like a senator. And uh, he called in various people and i ended up getting asked to go to uh i don't know if you've got them in the states it's called trading standards they're people that make sure you do what you like you call a plumber and he's actually not a plumber but he's going to charge you plumbers rates and he does a bad job so these people called me in said i should bring a solicitor i had to have a two-hour interview under police caution and they said I said, why am I here? And they said, well, you're pur purporting to be an expert. And if you're not, you're looking at two years in prison. So I said, two years in prison? They said, yeah. I said, oh. So anyway, they, they looked at my, my CV. They looked at my certificates. It took them six weeks to check everything out across the world. You know, I qualified all over the place, Sweden, Germany, America. And... Uh, and they came back and said, oh, yeah, you are an expert. And I thought, well, great. You know, there's, there was no apology. But it's unusual. They will go after a, a figure, but they won't go after the average person. They've got no money, no time. And so it's a very difficult world for Joe Public. Very difficult world. Crazy. Insane. Yeah. So what, I guess they're not adopting the SIRS construct in the uk what are they calling mold illness it doesn't exist the, not even a name for it no i'm, I'm not i'm not aware of it but mm. my, when my when when i walked into my doctors when i could hardly walk and i was my words were coming out backwards he thought i was a lunatic um when i went back in there a couple of or whatever i got diagnosed with ADHD then I've got diagnosed with bipolar and then what was the other thing I've got I got diagnosed with something else and I went to I went to my chemist shop um, and I said to the chemist I said I'm going to end up coming back here with I'm going to be one of those people with a big pill box aren't I where I'm going to have 50 pills in the morning and 50 pills in the afternoon she laughed she said yeah she said you know you're on the you're on the start of it and I thought, well, I'm not having it. So I threw them all away. And uh, I spoke to the psychiatrist and, uh, and I said, what am I going to take for my ADHD? And because that become quite hard work during COVID because I couldn't get out and do stuff, you know, I couldn't go and do what I wanted to do. I bought an ambulance because I could then, I bought an out of service ambulance, still had blue lights on it. So I could drive about and I was free. But without that, I could stuck indoors drive me nuts and the doctor said to me he said why do you want to cure your ADHD you've made a success of it all your life so I couldn't really argue that you know because it has brought me great benefits um, and I said but it's it's not all great because I, I I've only ever read two books in my life apart from technical manuals I read I can enjoy technical manuals but can't read books and I said, and I can't keep friends. I just move on, you know. I just lose patience and move on, you know. So, anyway, um, it's too late now. So I just, uh, I was out this morning at half past six, and I've got home at half past six, seven o'clock tonight. 
and I've had a, I've had a bit of steak and a cup of tea and I'm still working very hard. So I'm delighted that, you know, the mold hasn't, I've got, I've got um, an interesting case that makes me quite regularly think about him. Unusually, I got a call from a local authority who said, would you go and investigate this tenant's house? Now, this is a tenant. So, blimey, they're bringing in me to look at a tenant's house. That's unusual. So I go knock on the door, and this huge, healthy-looking black man came to the door and a great big smile. And as he opened the door, I could see black mould a metre high all the way around his flat. And I looked at him and I looked at this and I thought, my God, I'm going to go and get a, not just, I'm going to go and get a hazmat suit, you know. But I looked at him and I looked at him and I said, you're not ill, are you? He said, no, man, I'm really rude health. He said, I'm great. So I went in and he had rising damp all the way around, uh, drywall walls. And um, he had stacky buttress a metre high, three foot high all the way around every wall in his flat, stacky buttress. And I looked at it and I looked at him and I said, I can't believe this, but you know what it was? I believe what it was. The stacky was so in control of the whole environment. It didn't need to release anything nasty. It didn't need to do gotcha. anything. And yeah, because it only releases if there's a threat, a competitor that it wants to dominate. Exactly. And I think it was destroying anything there like bacteria and this man was so healthy he said man i'm so healthy and you know and he looked it and i'm thinking that this stacky was actually keeping him well it was a sort of symbiotic existence you know so it was a uh, don't often see that it's the only case i've ever seen it but um there we go yeah so um so what else have i got that's interesting over here um well the insurers have definitely dumped down oh well, we've just had a case uh, funny enough a man uh, a doctor funny enough a doctor um he got so sick but he you know the thing is with people with mild mold illness um they go nuts don't they i mean i go nuts everybody goes nuts and um you end up getting 50 emails a day off them. And, and everybody knows that now, you know, I go, I go to my solicitor friend and say, I've got a mold client. I've got, I've got a mold client for you. No, thank you. No, thank you. My email box is full up. I don't want any more emails, you know, because when someone takes notice of a mold patient, they don't stop giving them information. So um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, a bit of brain fog there. Um, no, I can't remember what I was going to say. So, no, move on. Well, it's just an interesting point that you made. We see that in our line of work also. You know, if people are looking for answers, if you give them a little attention trying to help, they'll just kind of bombard you for information. <clears throat> and I think it speaks to that state of panic that people feel. I mean, this isn't like a psycho emotional, psychological experience where these people are crazy. These people are being poisoned to where they're literally right. feeling a sense of panic and it comes off looking like intense, maybe scrambled, unclear communication, but it is a sign or a symptom of just how sick these people are and really how desperate they are. The problem is, you know, it's, it's like I've seen it. I've, I've, you know, you see these things as you get old. Um, my son, uh, my, my, my eldest son, he had bipolar. And um, um, if, he, if he mixed with some people, he got worse. And I'm not going to say it's catching, but I am going to say that if you mix with happy people, you're happy. If you mix with miserable people, you get miserable. And I think that's normal and logic. So I think this, you, you have to try and be careful not getting too involved and take on uh, everybody's problems. You can end up making yourself ill by taking on everybody else's problem. I really think that. So I, 
I say to people, no, it, it only hurts if it's my blood. You know, I, I try not to. I, I don't. I, I try to give empathy, but it's it's wearing thin, and I try to be factual. You know, um, I'm trying to say, look, you know, maybe you should do this. The problem is, is what advice can you possibly give to anybody? You know, you can't. I can't say go and see a doctor. I can't. You know, there's people advertising that they're following the Schumacher protocol. I don't even know if that works. So you know, Schumacher and his team help me, but guess what? Guess what, Eric? Guess what I was prescribed? Well, the cholesterol, the VIP, cholestar and all that. yeah, cholesterol, and VIP. You know, why did I need the brain scans, the blood tests, the the the, the gene? I had two genies. You know, I've spent thirty thousand dollars on a load of testing because I thought I was special. And it ends up I'm taking cholesterolamine and, and I'm and I'm taking V. I've got to tell you, the VIP done me a load of favors because I found with the VIP, I've bitten my fingernails all my life. I had uh, I think I had four of the bacteria in the in the in the nasal swab. And I got on the VIP and one day I was scratching myself and I um and I cut myself. I thought, what's that? And I had fingernails. I'd suddenly stopped biting my fingernails. And I think that, I mean, this, it, well, I know you wouldn't think I'm nuts, but um, I think there was bacteria in my head that was telling me to bite, to lick my fingers of the terrible, disgusting habit that it is because it wanted more bacteria to help grow. And I'm sure it was telling me to do it because when I took the VIP, I swear to God, Within, I don't know, four or five weeks, I had a, I, I went to a manicurist. You know, I, I don't need a manicurist now. I'm back, I'm back down to my elbows with biting my nails. But it's, interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, well, we uh, consider a lot of interesting concepts here that other people aren't really venturing into. And uh, the one about hanging out with positive people, or happy people, and avoiding negative people. You know, when you get to a point of hypersensitivity, you can tell that people have a cloud around them and you can sense it and it's depressing. A, a person who's drenched in mold can walk into a room and turn an entire room full of people depressed. So I can't help but wonder if by avoiding negative people and hanging around with positive people, you're actually avoiding a neurotoxic substance, which is on them. Yeah. Up, yeah. Well, you know, I can't think. Greg Weatherman told me about it. He saw it. Um, he was saying that um, there's no evidence that bacteria and mold communicate through VOCs. So if someone has got a mold infection in their lung, like Aspergillus fumigatus, for example, but who knows? Is there, is, is there other mold infections that we carry and we're unaware of, like the Marcons or whatever it might be, and they are giving off VOCs, you know, and maybe they react with other people. I, don't, I, I, I just don't know. Things just seem so odd so often that I can't put it down to charts. I, I, you know. Yeah, I've read about quorum sensing, the idea that one colony can affect another colony, even through a screen, even through a sheet of plastic, which makes really? you wonder if there's something even more than VOCs. It might be some electrical type emission. Ah. Well, funny you say that, Eric. I, I, you know, you know, when you look at Chinese medicine and the Chinese, you know, and you wonder how they've got these in, incredible cures. But well, it's because they've got millions of people that they practice on, and they get there quicker than we do with fifty or two hundred million people, and. Um, I just wonder that, uh, you know, perhaps all of these things, I've lost what I was going to say again. Um, no, I perhaps the Chinese have lucked into or by sheer observation, come up yeah. with some observations of electrochemical interactions. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, I've gone into homes where people, they're just ordinary people. And I walked into their homes and their house, their, their home was covered in, um, uh, cooking foil you know um, the baking foil all over their walls you know what you put a wrap of turkey in to cook and they've got it all over their walls I said what, what, what are you doing there 
Well, we don't know, but uh, we all feel ill if, when we go past that place. And uh, I ended up buying, uh, I bought about, I don't know, about $2,000 worth of um, um, radiation detectors, uh, EMF, and uh, different radio waves, radio frequencies. And I was in a house, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm an expert on this, and I, oh, remind me Chernobyl in a second. Um, but I went into this house, and this young young lad, he's about thirty five, very very sick, and um, and I and I and I I saw a cable behind his bed, and I thought, well, I'm just going to get my EMF meter and my other meter, and it was it went off the scale, and I said to his dad, "What on earth is that?" He said. It's nothing. He said, we used to have a television on the wall behind his head. Ball. It was the other way round. The bed was at the other side of the wall. He said, we changed his bed around and we took the television away, but the cable's still there. Well, I said, this boy is sleeping with his head on a cable that is off the scale. Now, what's that doing to him? And I've, and I've had it before where I've gone in and a, 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 a little boy, four or five years old, bed went in, you know, neurologically challenged and at the back of his cot was the electric meter for the house behind it on it sunken in the wall behind him from the other side and i said to the mum turn his bed round and she phoned me up about three days later she said i can't believe the difference chernobyl let me tell you this i've just started to do this um this is why I bought the meters, by the way. Um, I read about the, um, uh, I mean, Bob Brandis, he, he, he did a, a mold from Mars or whatever it is. But I read about Chernobyl and they said, you, do you all know about Chernobyl? Yeah. Chernobyl was, yeah, yeah. Um, well, they, they had to pour concrete over the, over the top of it you know, brave men gave their lives pouring this concrete over to create a sarcophagus to stop the radiation uh, dust escaping. And about three years ago, they said, it's going brown. What's happening? Is the concrete being destroyed? It's going brown. So they went up onto the roof to find out why it was going brown. I thought it might be rust from the re reinforcing bars or whatever. It was a mold. And they said, Hey, this is a mold. But what's surprising is it's growing towards the gamma radiation source. It well, thrives on radiation. Amazing. Yeah. And you've got it on the International Space Station. They're growing mold on the outside of the International Space Station. And when we talk about killing mold with bleach, you know, and you've got gamma radiation at the strength of Chernobyl and it's thriving on it. So much so, they're talking about using this particular mold as a coating on future spacecraft. Now, that particular mold, I've found out, grows in people's homes. Now, I'm not saying that it's because of the radiation, but it grows in people's homes. Now, it's mad, isn't it? It's mad. And, you know, these are, it's just pulling a couple of different pieces of information together and saying, oh, yeah, two and two does make four, yeah. Well, it's fascinating to think that um, mold is actually doing things that we know nothing about, utilizing yeah. this type of radioactive energy as a power source. And you might recall that during the 2015 Phoenix SIRS conference, I actually presented on nanoparticles and surface energy as an energy source for toxic mold. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So I was uh, trying to get people to look into what mold is doing strangely in the presence of um, possibly charged particles. We know that electromagnetic fields, I mean, um, I've looked at Dr. Klinghart's theory that it produces 600 times more toxins, but by taking known samples of mold into uh, electromagnetic fields or around cell towers, I don't find that it seems to be quite as bad as he says but still, there's something there worth looking into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I was. Um, I, 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 we just had a nutritionist um, conference. Dr. Klingart was there, and a load of them was there. And I, 
you know, they were talking about in um, they were talking about toxic mold, and I said, I just raised the question. I said, well, you you keep mentioning toxic mold. What what, what about the inflammations and and from from other things, including mold, but from the high fans spore fragments and the audience started shaking their head as if to say what is this idiot talking about you know they were shaking their heads and i was thought you know these are the leading people and i and i just thought you know it's okay you know it's um it's almost a it's almost a lost battle on calls and the thing is is that the more i've just found it with a with a friend of mine sarah she's um her son was really affected by mold and she's become a mold lunatic you know she writes ten thousand letters and you know she's suing everybody in the planet and um but she she comes up she finds out stuff all of the time but the problem is is you have to stop listening because I've got no more room left to store any information. <laughs> you know, I, I can't do anything with it. I can't do anything with what I know, let yeah. alone, you know, you, 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 you start to sound like a know-all that is a freak, like, like you. <laughs> no, you're just, I'm not being rude. Ever. You know, everybody recognises you, the, you're the man. But <laughs> it's, um, you know, you, you, nobody gets a medal for that. You know, it's like, oh, well, People prefer us, but oh, where's the man? What's his name? Um, the American. Um, uh, he's a PhD. Uh, Michael something Pinto. Um, you know, everybody reveres him, and uh, the the stuff I've seen him right, I'm thinking I'm, it's questionable. And someone said he's not, hasn't got a real PhD. You don't know anything anymore, do you? I, I mean, I don't. I just don't know anymore. Don't know. Well, it's true that it becomes so overwhelming. I mean, you can go so deep into this that you can't use any of it because it's just too much. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, I'm just I want to I want to try and get back now to saying wash it off and throw it away. You know, it's um, and I'm and I'm saying to people, you know, everybody comes on to me and they go, Jeff, have I got to move? Have I got to throw everything away? And 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 I say. It depends how you are. It's nothing to do with what's there. It's how you react to it. And sometimes Completely. the people, sometimes the people are more afraid well, than the actual reaction. Well, I know that it's hard to come by deserts in uh, the UK, uh, but what we do here in the West, Western United States, is by going camping in the desert and getting a sense of what it's like to be completely mold free, then you can go back to your environment and make your own educated decisions about how much of this you want to put up with. Mm. At mm. least you know how much it's affecting you. But at well, least I'll in the UK, you... you can take a trip to uh, Greece, to Crete. Yeah. Crete in particular seems to be a really good mold-free place. And there are people diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis who've gone to Greece for a week, and they say they feel almost normal. Well, I'll tell you something funny. I went to the Antarctic five years ago. And uh, I was on a, a, an 1895 sailing ship as crew. And uh, so it was real tough work. And we came to a place where we was going ashore. And we went ashore in rubber dinghies. And uh, it, it was millions of penguins. I couldn't get off the boat. And I had to go in my cabin because the mould on the penguin feces made me sick i couldn't get off the boat just the offshore wind i mean you're talking a thousand years of penguin dung what kind but, of temperature was it there oh it's it's uh one degree two degrees huh goes you know, down because, to minus it's the coldest yeah. place on the planet when it's winter i mean i was in there in the spring well, i can't help but wonder if the uh algae blooms the cyanobacteria was combining with the the excrement to make a perfect storm for production of cyanotoxins. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's well possible, but they they was on the rocks, not in the sea. So, and the, and the snow wasn't melting. So, I don't know what it was, but I I I went ashore once. I couldn't go ashore again. 
which was a terrible shame. And you know, I tried very hard, but yeah. don't know what yeah. it is, but it's something. Yeah, yeah, that, no, that's exactly it. Exactly it. Yeah, yeah. So, so how's how's the group going now? So, what's uh, I forget her name for a moment. Um, he was very much working with her, um, lady. Um, what well, Lisa Patterson? Yes. Uh, well, she's kind of backed out of mold. It got to be too overwhelming. Oh, I right. mean, there's only so much madness you can put up with. And she still maintains a group. And her information is still out there. You can find it in the Mold Avoiders group. But uh, I believe right now she might be working on a recipe book. Well, this is what I'm saying. I think it just wears you down. Because you're taking on the world. You're not, you're not taking on... You're not taking on something that's tangible. You're taking on ideas and trying to help people and and nobody believes you. And and you know what's the most amazing thing for me? I I I I go through my emails by accident sometimes and I look, I'm looking for someone and I get, I don't know, 70 emails from somebody. And they don't stop emailing me. And when I ask them, you know, I do a job for them, probably sometimes pro bono. And I ask them for a reference for my Google review or something. They can't be bothered or they've disappeared. You know, not very nice people, most mold people, you know. And I don't know what it is. I just don't know. They say they're not different from anybody else, but I don't know. It's just, I just, Sometimes I feel that it's not worth the effort. Um, <laughs> there's there's not a lot of uh, thanks in it at the end of the day. Yeah, you have to wonder if people with mold are neurologically affected in such a way that makes them not very nice people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's true. It's true. What's you ladies all got to say? You haven't said much, have you? I mean, I'm just blown away by this conversation and um, I'm so glad that we connected with you because you are, you evoke basically everything that we feel and that we resonate with and that we believe. Um, and so it's really nice to have um, you as a mold inspector in the UK kind of sharing this knowledge, even though you're so far away and we're in the US and it's just really your, your journey is just so interesting. And I really appreciate you sharing what your daughter went through, what you went through and kind of just alluding to the fact that, you know, testing is, is not hundred percent and can often drain people's funds on top of treatment and everything. And at the end of the day, it's really about just getting out of the exposure, um, in order to help your body to, to get over, um, being made ill by mold. Do you know, do you know um, I'm not going to mention names, but you know him very well. He's one of your prospective guests. He does online surveys. And I just don't understand how someone can see into a wall with infrared goggles or moisture map with his eyes um, and, you know, see building defect that's been camouflaged because that's what I see when I go to someone's house and I've, you know, they say, Oh, I've had Mr. So-and-so from America. Um, he's done an online survey and I, and I just, I've just lower my head and I think he's probably charged. I, I don't know. What's an expensive waste of money. It's, it's anything, you know, that you, that's a waste of money, you know, um, the construction in the UK is totally different from the USA. So it's cheating as far as I'm concerned. And it seems to me that there are people that set out with good intention and have ended up being twisted by the buck. And they're now, and I'm not, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm old enough that I don't care anymore, but, I've never wanted to charge people a lot of money to do something that was worthless. And, you know, I turn people away now and say, look, I've, I can't help it because if you can't afford my survey, you're not going to afford anything else. So you're just off best, you know, moving out or, you know, 
finding another place to rent. Um, but anyway, you know, the getting back to the IEPs, I I think as as big a name as they are, and of all the big, I know all the big names in America. There's very few that I um, would trust with my granny. You know. Um, I reached out to an IEP in one of my exposures a few years ago, and the only thing he wanted to do was, one, convince me that all of the symptoms I was explaining to him couldn't possibly be real because mold only causes allergies, and two, he wanted me to give him a fee to basically contract him to then testify in court over a landlord dispute. So it felt very much like no actual real help in navigating the situation. And I was really turned off by IEPs after that. And I kind of did like an underground reach out to a bunch of them via telephone just to see what answers I would get. And overall, I just found poor understanding of mold toxicity as an entirety from the the locals to me at least mm, mm, yeah and you know what, what what's what's sad is is you know where you've been you've been involved with it for years you say you know you shouldn't have been you should have been you should have been being resolved by now you know I, I on my website i've got a burning hand and uh i've on my on my website i say if you if you go to the local hospital with a with your, and you've burnt your hand and they dress it and they put soothing cream on and you come back home and put your hand in the fire you can't really complain that you're not getting better but that's what people are doing when they go to the nutritionist and buy vitamin c magnesium and cholesterol and they buy all the stuff and then they go and sleep in a bedroom that's full of mold and they can't understand why they're not getting better and what's more annoying to me is that the nutritionists and doctors are prescribing more and more and more drugs and changing the prescription um, when they're not, when the people are still living in a toxic environment. And I just can't understand why people can't see that. Just don't understand why they can't see it. Eric talks so, about this all the time when, when mold illness was connected to chronic fatigue syndrome in Lake Tahoe years ago. You know, he said everyone got this what was called a mystery illness at, at the time. And the people who descended to prey on the suffering were people selling green smoothies and supplements and, and meditations. And it's yeah. also a sociological issue that we talk about with our audience. Like, please do not sit here and try to fix your body from a problem that's caused by your environment. Like, stop thinking that your body is the problem when your environment is poisoning you. There's nothing that you can do to make your internal environment perfect and healthy with any amount of supplements if the problem is outside of you. And people are so groomed in medicine to think that it's a dysfunction internally that it's like they can't even be cognizant of flipping the paradigm opposite. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, and that's, that's the struggle, isn't it? It's, that's the struggle where people really ought to, you know, if, if you said to someone you keep hitting your finger with a, nap, with a hammer, it's never going to get better. They'd understand that. But you say to them live in a toxic environment, they don't understand that. I, 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 don't, I don't understand that either. So, yeah. Well, I would like to mention one tidbit that came out of the 2019 Fort Lauderdale, Florida Mold Congress. Uh, Dr. Chin Yang presented on Stachybotrys' evil twin, Stachybotrys chlorohalinata. Now, this is fascinating to me because they found that it's morphologically identical to charterum. So if anybody were to look at it, they would not be able to tell the difference. It's only by genetic testing, PCR, only way. And what was but that one? It's uh, called chlorohalinata. That, that's, not the, on any, it's not on any of the ERMI type. Uh, no, it's panel, not. It? And it should be. And here's yeah. why. Because this particular mold puts out immune suppressing compounds without the neuroinflammatory ones. So it's strictly yeah. shutting off your immune system with no yeah. signs of what it's doing. 
So you might see somebody sick and you test for stachybotrys and think, well, maybe it's not a harmful stachybotrys, but maybe their immune system is slowly being shut off by this chlorhalonata yeah. and they didn't know because nobody's been publicizing this evil twin. Well, I've never heard of it before and there's no lab that I know of ever shown me it. Um, oh, I've got, I've just remembered something that we might find interesting. Um, I was doing a job in London by Tower Bridge, funny enough, and it was snow and, uh, and I was in there and I, I didn't feel well. And I came out and I sat on a park bench and took most of my clothes off and I couldn't believe what I was doing, but I was burning. And, um, I realized I wasn't well and passerby came up and called an ambulance and, uh, ambulance came and they took my pulse and my heart was stopping. Now this wasn't. Yeah. This wasn't a um, irregular heartbeat. It was stopping. So they, blues and twos, took me to hospital. And they took me in and they put me on a, um, an ECG machine. And it didn't work. And, uh, and they said, oh, it doesn't work. So they went and got another ECG machine. And it didn't work. And I laughed because I wasn't, I wasn't feeling ill now. I was okay. And I laughed and I said, maybe it isn't what you think it is. And, um, and, they, and I said, maybe it's not picking up a signal because it's a different type of electrical impulse. So they went and got a crash trolley, which is the latest equipment, and they put that on me. And that didn't work either. Now, you don't believe, no one's going to believe this. So anyway, uh, I said, why don't you just listen to my heart? Because I could feel my pulse stopping. And they listened to it and they pushed a red button and they got nurses to come and take me straight to intensive care. And they put me in intensive care. So I'm laying in intensive care. I'm wired up and, uh, and I'm feeling fine. I'm sitting there reading a book or something that I'd seen on the side. I think I was reading the Bible that was there. And, um, uh, they, they brought in a heart specialist from another hospital to come and have a look at me and he sat on my bedside and he said I don't know what's going on with you I've never seen this before but we're going to keep you in but it doesn't appear to affect you so I don't know what it is so we're going to release you tomorrow if it doesn't reoccur all right the same thing happened to me in Spain and I was taken to a hospital in Madrid and exactly the same scenario I spoke to Schumacher about it and he said I should wear this uh, electrocardio pack that will record my heart. But I found it, it's happened to me three times I've ended up in hospital uh, and it was three jobs that I was doing with decontamination where I wasn't wearing proper PPE. Now, I don't know what species it was, but you know, you're only going to get the 36 species that you normally get with PCR DNA. But something there was causing my heart to stop with no pain whatsoever. And I could feel it and it would stop for, I don't know, maybe 25 beats and then start again. So this has been seen with stachybotrys. Is it? Oh, yeah, it's been studied. It's been documented. Do you oh. have a re uh, record of your QT interval? No. Okay. Um, we need the uh, the readings to find out how the autonomic function, how the uh, interview interval of the filling to the emptying of the heart, how long that's taking. Okay. But um, yeah, that's that's been documented, and we're suspecting that it's leading to the broken heart syndrome, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And what is that? Well, people say that people under severe stress they die of a broken heart. Oh. And there's uh, increasing instances of what they call this broken heart syndrome. And what they're finding out is the autonomic function, it's messed up so badly that people's heart literally stops beating. It's well, an amazing thing. Eric, I seem to be a walking, walking time bomb. I seem to <laughs> expose myself to so much that it's... Uh... I don't know. I'm going to get buried in a mold suit, by the way. I've seen it advertised. All it's right. A, it's a Tyvek suit. 
been inoculated with all different species and I'm going to get buried in it. Okay. You can turn into more molds or perhaps a tree. Yeah, well, I might turn into a mushroom. I don't know about a tree. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you but, living uh, now, Eric? Are you still out in the in the Arizona, was it? Uh, actually, I'm up at Lake Tahoe, where Lake I got Tahoe. sick all these years ago. Ah. And doing very well by mold avoidance because I know the bad areas. And I know right. by using my heart like a Geiger counter, how much exposure I can take and when it's time to run. Really? Do you know, I was in a house a couple of weeks ago and um, uh, the wife was sick, the husband wasn't. And uh, so he was wandering around following me and I had, I've got Tramex equipment that, I don't know, it's about £3,000 worth, $4,000 worth of moisture measurement equipment. And, uh, and I'm walking around and he came out and he got two coat hangers and put them into a biro, you know, a biro each. And he was walking behind me with these two coat hangers as a, as a diviner. He dowsing. He, it's again. Okay. We call it dowsing. Yeah, that's it. And, and he went, there's moisture in that wall. And, I, and there was. Uh, is it is moisture in that wall? And there was. And I'm looking at him. I think, well, if you know there's so much bloody water here, why don't you get it resolved and your wife will get better, maybe? But anyway, I said, let me have a go at those sticks. There was coat hangers in a biro. It works. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I've got $3,000 worth of equipment here and he's got two coat hangers. You know, <laughs> I, just, I just have to laugh, you know, and I just think, what do we know? You know, it's just madness, isn't it? It is, but you know, in a way, it makes you wonder if there's like electrical currents and somehow those rods are responding to them. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Oh, it works. So I'm not poo-pooing it or laughing at it. I'm just laughing at me carrying all this expensive equipment. And there's, there's Fred Flintstone walking behind me with a coat hanger, you know. And I... Yeah, my stepfather did a demonstration of this for me. Same exact thing. I mean, these people are trying to find a buried water pipe. They've got all the expensive equipment. <laughs> they can't find it. And some guy comes out with a dowsing device, just a couple of rods, goes right to it. And yeah. he could, my stepfather goes, that's amazing. Can, can anybody do that? Sure. Hands it to him. And he reproduced it. He was able to do it. I'll, I'll tell you what I've, I've, I've just done. I've, 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 I was in America a couple of months ago. And um, I, went out, I went over there to do a course on concrete investigation i don't know if you know you, you probably ought to know um they changed the mix of cement about 40 years ago that's why a lot of the american buildings are now collapsing because the concrete's only lasting 40 years not not 120 that it's always lasted so i went out there to learn how to measure with some new techniques on it and um Oh, oh, it was really interesting. I forget what I was going to say again now. Um, no, well, we do know that the concrete is more dangerous because they're incorporating more fly ash in it, more garbage. Oh, right. oh, and it's really? producing more hydrogen sulfide. Is it? Uh, That's what I've well, heard. Well, it's, um, we keep seeing concrete that's failing and um, absorbing moisture. And the, oh, that, that was a, a point. The method that we've always used to measure if a concrete floor is dry is completely flawed. Wow. And uh, it, yeah, it, yeah, it's a well. And it is now a new American standard. And, uh, and I'll, I'll explain it to you briefly, and you'll get it straight away. If, if, if a concrete floor is six inches thick and you're measuring the top surface, or maybe even drilling into it three eighths of an inch, half an inch to take calcium carbide, and you're saying, oh, it's dry. The reality is that top one inch is reflecting the environmental conditions in the atmosphere. So if the humidity is high above it, the concrete's going to be high. If the humidity above is dry, the concrete will redry. But the moisture is five inches down all the way through, and it will permeate up when that top, when the humidity changes, that moisture will still be there and cause water damage and mold under resilient coatings and floorings. So 
there's a lot to learn um, in the industry about new measurement techniques and um, well there it is that's there's there is a lot to learn about measuring and i think measuring is a key with mold whether you're measuring uh, you call it grains per pound i call it uh, grams per kilogram but you know actual weight of water in the air um, i'm measuring dew point all over the place now in buildings because i know that people get mold where they don't think they're getting mold where there isn't water damage it's not a leak but there's dew point condensation so these are the issues that I see that many inspectors don't understand. And they say, your house is dry when it might be dry, but it's still water damaged. And I don't mean was water damaged. It's water damaged next week, next month, anytime soon. And if you so, didn't know the history, you'd never know that the standards have changed. Exactly right. Exactly right. And uh, nobody does know the standards have changed and everybody's trying to avoid the issues because there's huge financial complications and as per usual you know there was big tobacco big farm there's big insurers isn't there you know and they don't want to pay oh this was something that i was going to say this doctor that got very sick he's ended up in hospital his whole home was full of catomium and the contractor said there's no stachybotrys there you're safe so he went back in there. He ended up in hospital. We had um, uh, miss. I think he called it miss, um, where you get white rings around your fingernails. Hmm. So you should check that out. It's M I double S, and it's it follows the shape of your cuticle, and it's just a white line. It's quite thick. It's about maybe uh, four millimeters, but it shows that there's um, a toxic imbalance of your body. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, miss lines, they're called. I'm sure they're miss lines. Um, anyway, the insurance company, uh, he's suing them because they sent the contractors in who said it was safe for him to live there. I mean, I've never said a building safe for anybody to live in. I've said it's low risk, but they said it was safe. Um, so he's suing them. So they've ended up giving him his money back for his premium of his policy and said, we don't want you as a client. Now, that's what insurance companies are doing in the UK. And it doesn't make sense. Ketomium is a notorious trichothecene producer. Yep. Yeah. Well, the insurers don't care about that, do they? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're oh, preying on to, somebody's got, ignorance. I've got to tell you this. I've got to tell you this. Um, I've got to be very careful and pick my words. Um, I got hired by an American company to do a, a mold check. Oh, well, we want to know there's no mold in this building, but we, it's a hospital. Well, the basement got flooded and the basement, the walls that went up were all built on top of a six by four timber. These are partition walls on the inside. All the wood was soaking wet, been submerged for weeks. And they hired me to come and say that it was mold free and no risk. Well, I went in there and I looked at it and I said, this has all got to be demolished. This is a brand new hospital. This has all got to come down. All these internal walls have got to come down. Those timbers have got to come out. You can't dry them because you've covered them in asphalt paper, but they're, but the, they're seams and, and breaks and rips so it's just going to continuously off gas more, more water vapor fill the cavity drywalls and you're going to get mold growth for the life of this building but they hired me because they thought i was a dumb englishman and didn't understand about these issues and uh, when when i wrote the report and i signed it off as a cr and acac and blah 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 they went this guy's American, no, he's English, but he's yeah, like, I've, I've qualified in the States over 30 years. So they threw me off the job. Now, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, one day someone's very soon, someone's going to get sick. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. They must have, I was quite frightened that they might come and kill me. <laughs> there must have been millions involved in this claim. So, uh, well, we'll have to keep an eye on it and see what happens in the future. Well, you, 
Do you know what? Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Harrods, which is one of the most prestigious stores in England. At the back of it, uh, some uh, Saudi businessmen built five brand new houses, six storey, three storeys was underground. Uh, and the contractors that won the contract to fit out with ventilation systems, they couldn't finish the contract. And um, they all got sick. And I got a phone call one day from the managing director of this ventilation company. He said, I'm told you might be able to help us. He said, I'm the managing director of this ventilation company. He said, I've been in the game 40 years. He said, I've had to try and finish the job that my foreman and my staff took on. They're all sick. I've had to go back on the tools. I'm in hospital with a collapsed lung. My partner's in hospital with a collapsed lung. None of my workforce can work. And we're getting sued for not completing the contract. Would you go to this building and check it out? So I went there. Again, I had a nosebleed within 10 minutes. But this building hadn't even got the windows in yet or the front door on yet. But it was so wet through wind and rain running through the windows where there was no windows, just the aperture. And the plasterboard drywall got wet and it was just full of stachybotrys and catonium. And they just painted it and people moved in. So these are going to be extremely wealthy people. These houses ranged in prices from something like $18 million to $24 million. And the people would move in there and I would almost be certain that someone's dead within a year. So Horrible. there it is. The world. <laughs> yeah, it feels like we're fighting against so many things. And sometimes it's hard to wake up and do this work every day because we're not really well received when we provide the truth. Have, um, have you have you ever listened to Ming Dooley? We tried to get her on. Um, Eric is more familiar with her. Oh, She's done a fabulous research paper on ought to have been slam dunk about um, mold illness. Uh, she researched 15,000 documents. Of, I've got a vibrator plate, exercise plate under my desk. I just set it off, just turned it off. Um, it, it, it does my legs. I've got bad knees. I should have had two knees replaced, but I, I put my feet on this and it helps me. Um, Ming Dooley, she researched 15,000 papers that mentioned mold illness, respiratory illness, chronic fatigue, all with mold as keywords. And she whittled it down to, I think, 12, um, 15,000, I think there was. She whittled it down, or it might have been 1,500. She whittled it down to 120 documents that are peer reviewed. That's, there's no question that peer reviewed papers are proving that there is. Uh, relationship causation mold illness and but she's yeah i actually in. sat with ming Dooley at the uh 2019 mold congress and discussed her her work the papers and i said but one thing that should be included in a report is that the cdc and nih have stymied mold research they have kept peer-reviewed literature from being in you know, or new literature from being peer reviewed and entered into the literature. And one of the things that they've suppressed is the fact that toxic mold actually started chronic fatigue syndrome. So you actually have a biased view by relying just on peer reviewed literature because you're in effect seeing what the authorities want you to see, what they slip through, and you're missing mm -hmm. all the anecdotal reports, all the hospitals, all the schools, all the people that got sick, and all the reports yeah. of toxic mold in association with what was later diagnosed as chronic fatigue syndrome, but they keep it out of the literature because there's no official link between the two. Gotcha. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. But anyway, she's a good girl and she's worth getting on. She's um, she's good girl. Yeah, I'm hoping that uh, I can get her to include that into a report because once people know, then they can look at how the evidence has been kept hidden from them and get the rest of the story. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Well, guys, I don't know how you are. I think, am I? Yeah, I mean, I would love to sit down and talk with you for <laughs> two, three, four more hours. Um, you have some really <laughs> great stories, but we're going to have to do a part two with you one of these days. Um, and we'd love to have you on again. And uh, we really want to support your work and what you're doing. So maybe we'll have a conversation off the record and how we can maybe partner with you or or do something with you, you know, being in the UK and us here in the US. So we'll we'll Excellent. dive more into that off off camera. And uh, thanks again for joining us, Jeff. Um, if Thank anyone you, who's in the UK that wants to work with you or consult with you, where can they find you? Well, I'm on buildingforensics.co.uk. That's well, it. All right. I, I, funny enough, I take my, there's no phone number on there because I get fed up with talking to people about mold. So, <laughs> they could, I, I answer their emails, but I say, please email me. I, and you know why? They never get to the point. They never get to the point. Yeah, it's it's hard to to work with uh, people who are really sick um, and, yeah. and get through to them. So we totally understand that because we deal with the same thing. But uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us, Jeff. It was a lovely conversation. My gosh, I mean, this was a gold standard conversation. We're going to yeah. praise this to the ends of the earth. So don't be surprised if you got a lot more emails coming coming through from our <laughs> from our platform here. Um, we don't want to overwhelm you, but <laughs> I just want to give you that heads up. Thanks again, Listen, my dear. I'll always try to help when I can. Thanks very much. Have a nice day, everybody. You too. Bye -bye. You take care. Bye-bye.